Depression, and today we go back in time to the months that led up to the stock market crash of October 29, 1929, with economist and best-selling author Nomi Prince to discuss her debut fiction work, Black Tuesday. Black Tuesday is the story of Leila Khan, a young Eastern European immigrant in New York who falls in love with Roderick Morgan, J.P. Morgan's nephew, while the depth of the economic crisis unfolds. Leila learns the shocking truth of the cover-up behind the stock market crash. After more than a decade working at top Wall Street financial firms, author Nomi Prince left her career to write three nonfiction books exposing fraud and deception from Wall Street to Washington. Washington. It takes a pillage, other people's money, and jacked. Nomi Prince is a senior fellow at Demos. She's been featured in several documentaries and is a frequent commentator for PBS, Fox, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, CNN, BBC, and others. And she now joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first, why do you think it was an important thing? What compelled you to put into a fictional context, the events of, and in, in a way, a very personalized context, the events of um, October 1929? Um, a couple things. One is that I think the emotional impact, the, the true humanity behind a lot of um, the shadiness and the fraud that you know we know about now vis-a-vis what the bankers have done and in parallel uh, what they were doing leading up to the crash of 1929 that was very hidden and very mysterious and and very criminal um, is is one aspect of understanding history and today, but also it's the human impact. It's how um, the deeds of people that have nothing um, to do in the daily lives of, of immigrants, of citizens, of the population really impact lives much more than they should. And the story is a way of looking at a family that's going through um, a deep struggle and, and the main character, the Khan, who is privy ultimately to some of these shady dealings, um, but isn't an economist or, uh, you know, a financial genius. She's just she's just a woman um, in love. And that becomes and takes on its own forms and makes her have to go through her own moral choices um, and internal conflicts as to deciding what is right and wrong Mm -hmm. and how right and wrong things can get. And so in a way, you you have uh, these two characters, Leila Khan and Roderick Morgan, uh, coming from the opposite um, populations, if you will, uh, Leila representing the 99%, Roderick representing the 1%. Of course, you wrote this book before the Occupy movement, but it's, I think, useful to use uh, some of the terms that have become popularized today. And in their connection, in them coming together, um, we sort of learn how the actions of the 1% affect the actions of the 99%. How did you uh, personify the the banker first of all because not much is known or is it um, did you do your re- did you do research based on uh, characters that actually existed in the banking world yeah I did an extensive amount of historical research on on newspaper clippings and on documents at the time um, that I had to dig around for to get a sense for um, the timelines of what was going on on Wall Street uh, leading up to the crash in 1929 um, in terms of the characters what I realized in piecing that information together is that the same people that run Wall Street today, um, you know, Jamie Dimon, who runs J.P. Morgan Chase today, is just a future version of Jack Morgan, um, mm-hmm. the real Jack Morgan, J.P. Morgan's son, who ran the Morgan Bank, which was the most powerful bank in America in 1929. So a lot of the characteristics of these people are very similar. They, they are, um, in a lot of aspects, sociopaths. They really do think that what they do um, is better and, and more deserving than the rest of the population. You know, that 1% to 99% distinction in their minds. Um, And then some of them are conflicted about it. And the main character, um, or the secondary character, Roderick Morgan, Jack Morgan's nephew, um, is committing fraud. And he's doing it, and he knows he's doing it, and it eats away at him. And at the same time, he keeps doing it. So I also show that distinction between the foot soldiers of the big CEOs and the big guns and how they're doing the dirty work, but really the shadowy figures behind them are pulling the strings. And yet your book, in a way, humanizes them. And I'm wondering what what was your reason for doing that? Um, sometimes it's easier, of course, for people who are struggling against uh, economic injustice to put all of these banksters into a box and and you know because we 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 wonder how do they live with themselves how do they look at themselves in the mirror every day 
Well, and that's the thing. Jack Morgan has no problem looking at himself because he believes himself to be um, God. You know, the same way Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs talked about the fact that he believes himself to be doing God's work. Um, and Roderick Morgan, the nephew, has has a little bit more of a complexity in dealing mm-hmm. with what they do. But that doesn't stop him from doing that. But he struggles. And he struggles with it. And, and, and it's not to really apologize for that, but it's to show um, that struggle also from the outside. Now, Lila's coming to it as, as a woman who doesn't know anything about Wall Street. You know, she's living on the Lower East Side, which is geographically close, but millions of miles away in terms of, you know, the 99 to 1% situation. And she just meets Roderick in a diner. And, and it's, um, you know, they have a human relationship, which is also very muddied and very complex and not black and white at all. And she learns how, you know, these, these people can justify to themselves everything that they're doing. Um, and at first, she believes some of those justifications, and then she stands to, you know, she she sees that that's not really the case, that, that really um, it's all a bunch of lies and smoke and mirrors, and that ultimately it comes down um, like a stack of buildings on, on her family, on her neighborhood, and on the nation. You also have a character, um, Leila's boyfriend, Nelson, in the book, who's an Irish immigrant, very active um, politically. Um, does he represent the sort of radical... Uh, pro-labor activism that was also very strong at that time in New York? Yeah, one of the things that I noticed that was very interesting to me in looking at the historical research to um, this time period is that um, there, there was certainly a lot of activism going on, a lot of strikes throughout the country, and those were relegated to the you know page 37 and page 49 um, in, in the New York Times and such as they sort of are today. They were, they were really in the background, unless these people were living through them and you're looking at the labor documentation, um, the front pages were all about the stock market and making money and how the country was in a boom. So there was this real distinction just in terms of, of how the media portrayed it. And Nelson O'Leary, the, the activist and her boyfriend, is, is very fiery. Um, he is violent. He's, uh, you know, he's lived in the gangs outside um, you know, within New York as well. His brother was killed by a gang. You know, He has um, a lot of personal issues as well as this militant need to have the country change. Um, and there's a scene which I wrote in the book, and, and I was reading it the other night because I hadn't even remembered that I'd written it, um, where he actually gets arrested with a group of people at the Fulton Fish Markets in New York City um, because they were protesting in the middle of the night because bankers were about to get bonuses because, this was after the crash happened, because President Hoover was basically shaking their hands and thanking them for being a part of what would rebuild the country and everything was going to be fine. And meanwhile, the police were arresting a whole bunch of of protesters down at the fish markets because all they wanted to do was have... their wages not cut into Christmas. Mm. Um, and they were rounded up and they were put in jail, a place called the Tombs down in New York City. Um, and they were kept there. And I was just looking at this and some of the statements in the book basically saying, look, you know, something happens on Wall Street. Everyone comes and tries to fix it. You know, our Federal Reserve fixed Wall Street in the last few years. Or, and something happens in the streets and people get arrested. And we've had 5,000 uh, Occupy Wall Street arrests throughout the country. Um, and nothing like that. Um no, in the banking yeah. community. Maybe one or two arrests, right? Um, well, uh, how much of what you see, uh, what you saw during and, and the research that went into the events leading up to the Great Depression mirror what's happening today? You write in your book how bankers basically got together to infuse large amounts of cash into the market to try to stave off investors' fears. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw some of that happen here and, and during our recession. Of course, it was a government who pushed that. Uh, are, are there stark differences between the re- reaction to the events leading up to the Great Depression and what we're seeing today? Um, there's, a, there's so many similarities. Mm-hmm. Back then, the, the instruments um, that bankers used were less complex. Um, there were things called trusts where bankers would basically tell their customers, their smaller customers, um, to get involved with them betting on these companies, mm-hmm. whether from railroads or oil companies and so forth, that were going to do great. And all they had to do was put their money in and they could become millionaires just like the bankers. And this, this got a lot of people in who, who were struggling, who wanted to find a way to basically make ends meet, to make their lives, to help their families. And, and they got involved in investing all their money and borrowing extra money to invest in these trusts. And ultimately, the bankers,
brokers got out first, um, which is what happens today. They basically create these financial instruments, suck everyone in. They have more information from the inside, so they're able to make a profit and get out while individuals are left holding the bag. Um, and that's very similar to what happened in the subprime, subprime crisis in 2008. Instead of things called trusts, which were very simple um, combinations of, of stock, basically, investments. These were CDOs and weird derivatives and all sorts of other more complex instruments, but really the same idea that um, banks were packaging up loans, uh, getting countries and pension funds and small townships in Europe, et cetera, to invest in them. Uh, they knew they were going to go sour. They took their profit and they let it go sour on, on the world. And as a result, we're, in, we're basically in the midst of a global depression. I'm speaking with author Nomi Prinz about her new book, Black Tuesday. It's a novel. and It's her debut fiction work. She is uh, known for her earlier books. It takes a pillage, other people's money and jacked. Uh, now, you worked on Wall Street for, what, nearly two decades. How much of what you experienced yourself in today's Wall Street uh, did you use in writing this book? I mean, obviously, you're intimate with the city of New York. Yeah, I, I'm from New York, um, and I, I've also uh, worked in banking in New York and, and in London before before stopping. I wasn't quite there for two decades. It was <laughs> a bit less than that. Um, it's, it's been two decades since I started there. There you go. Um, but the... I, I, one of the things I've, I learned through my experiences um, is, one, it's very easy to create the illusion of good investments mm -hmm. when what is being sold is very, very far from that. It's, it's very simple to engineer faulty assets and to have no problem as a banker to sell them wherever they can be sold and to make whatever profits they can make. Um, but also the mentality of the people I worked for and the people I, I couldn't ultimately stand and, and, and left behind to become a journalist. Um, and I mentioned the term before, this, this, this sociopathic nature um, that they had, and they might not, they might not go around actively murdering people, but, but, but they do have um, this notion that they are elite, that they are separate, that they are different, that they are better, um, that if someone isn't making money or isn't wealthy or isn't in their circle, they, they just don't matter. Um, and, and that mentality was something that was obviously very distasteful for me. I left it. Um, but also something that I, I noticed when I look back at, at the history of, of, of some of the people like the Rockefellers, like, like the Morgans, um, like Huntington here in, in, uh, in mm -hmm. Pasadena, that um, most of the story about these people's lives, the accepted stories, is how great they were, how they were titans of industry, captains of finance, how they built things, how they financed things. Um, and the reality is they, they lived very separate lives. They were very ruthless. Um, they had no problem with that, and they left a lot of, of dysfunction and struggling and economic decay um, behind them and for the rest of the population back then in in, in the Great Depression and, and now in, in what I believe to be a second global depression. Mm -hmm. Naomi Prince, I'm wondering if you would read from your book Black Tuesday for our listeners so they get a sense of what uh, the story is that you've written. Um, well, um, th this is a scene I'm, I'm, I'm looking at here that takes place on the morning of October 29th, 1929. Um, there's already been a bunch of bankers who've gotten together on the Thursday before that to put money, as, as you mentioned, into the market, basically to give the illusion to investors in the market that it was going to be okay to suck in the last drop of, of the money of the people. And um, there's been a, a fight between Lila and Roderick because he's basically told her what he's been up to and she's flipped out out at him, um, and also because her, her own uncle, her own family, um, stands to basically lose everything. Um, and so they have a fight. He goes back to work, um, and there's chaos in the streets. It's, it's the morning of Black Tuesday. There, there's, there's people all over New York and, you know, in real life fighting, trying to get their money. Um, and uh, Tom Lamont, who's the acting head of, of the Morgan Bank, he, he reports to Jack Morgan, who, who is out of the fray. He's just dealing with all of this from the shadows. He's making his money, not dealing with it. Comes into Roderick's office and says, you know, uh, we, we, we got to go over to the exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, where all the, the chaos was going down. So the exchange was the last place Roderick wanted to be. It was just like his uncle to stay away from the fray, always in the shadows. He grabbed his overcoat and hat and followed Lamont. From across the lower lobby, Roderick saw a cluster of men before the bank's doors, yelling at the Morgan guards with fists clenching stock certificates. Lamont said, not that way. Come on, out the back. 
The two men exited the back the bank through the same steel doors that normally opened for truckloads of gold bars. Once outside, they had no choice but to barge through the crowds to reach the back door of the exchange across the narrow street. Fortunately, there were less people on this side of the exchange than raging directly in front of it, but the task was still far from simple. Just when they reached the back of the exchange, two guards told them to wait outside so that people wouldn't spot two Morgan partners entering. They might kill you, said an exchange guard. Roderick adjusted his hat to cover his eyes and waited by Lamont. He was looking down at his shoes when a man wearing a gray overcoat and matching bowler matched, marched up to him and punched him in the stomach. Roderick doubled over. May you rot in hell, said the man, before he spit in Roderick's face and ran off. Um, and that's kind of mm-hmm. the only interaction these people had with, right. with anyone real they had hurt. Uh, and and uh, following up on that, um, how conscious were you when you were writing this book to uh, to uh, contrast the class differences? Class is a word that we don't talk about enough these days, but back in the time when your novel was set, it was a an important concept and an, an accepted concept. Yeah, I mean there was there was the banking class, um, and there was a lot of secrecy around that class. And in and, and a lot of this book is is if you step back into the mindset of people that lived in that time, you know now we know a lot more, and there's a lot more uh, news coverage of bankers, and there's there is the Occupy movements and everything else. But back then they were just um, completely separate from from the rest. And um, there wasn't really a notion of a middle class. There was a working class um, and an upper class. And the upper class used the working class to to do whatever it is they needed to have done in order to make their lives even more comfortable. And 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 they made the money, and, and the working class really struggled. Um, and there was a tremendous dislocation in, in wealth. There was there was as much wealth inequality then um, in the country as there actually is now. It's just that we have um, a. a uh, dying middle class, a, a contracting middle class now as sort of buffer um, between those classes. So it looks a little bit different. And back then it was much more um, visceral. There, there were really two kinds of people and they, they didn't interact. They, they didn't have to. I'm speaking with Nomi Prince about her new book, Black Tuesday. It's her first novel and uh, you can uh, actually see her at Book Soup tonight, where she will be discussing her book and signing copies of Black Tuesday. Book Soup is located at 8818 Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. Again, tonight, Nomi Prince with a book event it's starting at 7 p.m. at Book Soup, 8818 Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. If you miss this information, check uprisingradio.org after 10 a.m. this morning. Let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing as the interaction between government and corporate America and and how it compares to the Great Depression and what was done to stave off the Great Depression. Um, uh, you know, there's some argument about what it was that actually lifted this country out of the Great Depression. But from your study of history and from your personal experience on Wall Street, uh, w- what do you think it was that actually worked and that can be applied to the recession we're seeing today, to today's depression? Well, one of the main things that happened after the crash in 1929 and it did take a few years, um, was there was a decision by FDR in Washington, um, who was a Democrat president, but he actually had a Republican Treasury Secretary, and uh, together they had a bank holiday. There was the PCORA commissions, which was investigations of what the bankers had been doing um, and the fraud they had been committing up, for, up to the crash in 1929. And there was a thing called the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which sought to protect the population by dismantling the banks such that banks could could no longer use other people's money, their depositors' money, the money of the population, to make their bets, um, which would both curtail them from making as many bets because they didn't have as much money to make them with, um, and also show them that if they did make bets, the government would not be there to help them out, and they had to make a choice. We did not do that this time around. After the crisis of 2008, banks have only been made bigger. They're more complex. They are continuing to use the, the funds and the assets and the loans of individuals in order to continue to make bets. The bets were in subprime a few years ago. Now they're in Europe. It doesn't matter to a bank where they make bets. Um, but that is that is why this depression is being exported right now because mm-hmm. there's just no, there was no regulatory will or legislative will to really beat them back, to really break them up and to really at least reduce the risk that they cause by the practices that they use on the rest of the economy. Are you hopeful with the emergence of the Occupy movement around the country? I am really hopeful. I think that the 
One of the main things, and it does a lot, that the Occupy movement shows is that a lot of different people who are impacted from different reasons, and this relates also to my character in the book. She wasn't this this crazy militant fighter. She she was a girl who saw things she couldn't handle seeing anymore and decided to take a stand. And I think a lot of the Occupy movement um, is like that. People are involved with different levels of knowledge about the financial crisis, about the economy. Um, they have different ways of expressing themselves, and they're all uh, from different walks of life and different backgrounds. And, and showing that there's a visible discontent with what is going on. And I think that's very important rather than it just being kept, you know, on the Internet or in the background or in the shadows. That it's, it's very visceral and it's very visible. Well, Nomi Prince, I want to thank you very much for joining us today and good luck uh, with your book. Thank you so much. Nomi Prince is uh, an author whose books you might have her, her, her earlier books you might have heard of. It takes a pillage, other people's money, and jacked. Her new book is called Black Tuesday. It's her first novel, and she's going to be at Book Soup tonight, 8818 Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood, at 7 p.m.